Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, Economies and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel. We're doing our first virtual meeting, so hopefully everything will go OK, but please do bear with us if we have any technical problems. Um, so I just want to welcome you all. My name is Harpreet. I'm the chair of the Economies and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel. And what we'll do is we'll firstly just go around the panel members and ask them uh, to introduce themselves. So I'll start with Councillor Eastwood. Hi, my name is Councillor Richard Eastwood representing Linley Ward. Thank you. Chris. Chris Friend, I'm a co-op team. Brilliant. Councillor Murgatroyd. Oh, hi, yeah. I'm Richard Murgatroyd, go to Ward. Great stuff. Ailey. Ailey Ogden, I'm a co-op team as well. And, uh, Andrew. Andrew, you just on mute. Andrew Bird, co-op tea. Great stuff. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, if colleagues can uh, remember just to mute themselves when they're not speaking, and obviously they unmute yourselves when, when you are speaking as well, that'd be perfect. So I'll just go through the agenda. We've done the membership of the committee. We Hello. have had some apologies um, this morning. Um, Yusra, Councillor Yusra, Yusra Hussein won't be able to attend the meeting. And uh, we are hoping that um, other colleagues may be able to join join us uh, later. I keep trying to, but it keeps muting me. OK, <laughs> I think we've got <laughs> Councillor Bolt uh, with us. Do you want Thanks. to introduce yeah, yeah. yourself? Martin Bolt, Murfield Ward Chair, yeah, thank you. Great stuff. So thank you, um, Councillor Bolt. So um, I've given the apologies. Um, if anyone has any does anyone have any interest to declare? No? OK. If if anything comes up later, please do just fill in the form um, to um, add your interest. Hi there. Councillor Taylor has joined as well. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, um, Councillor Taylor, um, one of the members for the ECAP Ward. Thank you very much. So we'll start off with minutes of the previous meeting. Um, do they look all right to members? Is, is someone happy to approve approve those? Could someone just say? Oh, they've got a few hands up, thumbs up, yes. Okay, I'll take, oh, thank you. Andrew and Councillor Murgatroyd have, have agreed those. Thank you very much. Um, admissions to the public. The meeting is being streamed in public. We're not meeting on site today. We've uh, not had any deputations or public questions for the meeting today. So we will move on to the local economic recovery plan. Um, our colleague Angela Blake is here to present uh, this uh, item. So Angela, if you could, uh, oh, there you go. We've got the presentation up um, and I'll hand over to Angela. OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Apple. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just for members that, that don't know me, my name's Angela Blake. I'm the Service Director for Economy and Skills. Uh, I'm just going to take the next 10 minutes to talk you through where we are with the Kirklees Economic Recovery Plan. Um, so the, the Kirklees Economic Recovery Plan is, is in draft stage at the moment. Um, it is due to go to Cabinet next week, but obviously given the circumstances and how quickly they're changing, it will be a fluid document that will be refreshed as, as, as new intelligence comes to the fore as, as we're working through this. We've been developing the document through an economic recovery partnership, which is, uh, involves a number of key stakeholders from, from Kirklees, including the university, college, chamber, etc., along with a, a number of private sector colleagues from both some of our large businesses, but also some of our RSME businesses. Um, we felt it was really important to take that approach to make sure that we've, we've got up to date intelligence and, and that we're getting that intelligence from the people that, that have experienced this directly in their own business practices, but are also engaging with a number of our businesses um, from, from across the area. The, the Kirklees Economic Recovery Plan will feed into a wider West Yorkshire plan, which uh, Jackie Gedman is the lead chief exec on for the West Yorkshire region. Um, and, and so we're meeting with them quite regularly to try and inform that, that West Yorkshire plan as well. 
So if we, if I just start to take you through the slides, so if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this, this is just to, to give you some idea of, of the economic impact as of uh, today that, that we're aware of. Um, so we've seen a significant fall in, in GVA in quarter two. Um, the number of workers that have been furloughed um, from since May is 50,400. Um, we've got a, a huge number of self-employed residents that have received report, support through the schemes that are available. We've seen a significant increase in benefit claimants um, from 10,225 in March to 18,870 in May. Youth unemployment has increased significantly, and this has gone up, in, just as a comparison, has gone up by 2,000 since the same period last year. Um, and and you, you will see youth as quite, youth employment um, as quite a strong theme as, as we go through um, the presentation. And we've seen a 60% reduction uh, in vacancies in the Leeds city region. Um, forecasts are telling us, um, and, and I think we know you will see from the media as well, and, and some of the support that was announced from government last night, that, that we are expecting a lot of the people that have been on furlough actually not to return to work. And we were already seeing a number of redundancies being um, announced today, uh, which is going to have an impact on, on some of our, our business and our residents. Uh, if we can move on to the, the next slide, please. So the objectives are, are very aligned with um, with what we're trying to do with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority as well. Um, so working with our anchor institutions to support the economic recovery, we're looking at how we can work together, how we can pull, pull our resources, um, how we can build on some things that are already in existence that, that actually we through we know working really well, but actually we need to put some more support into those now uh, going forward um, and, and making the offer much stronger. Um, key things for us from the information that we're getting back from businesses is that the, one of the biggest things is cash flow is, is a massive impact on our local businesses. Um, but we're, there are some, you know, it's not all negative. We are also seeing some positive messages coming back. Some businesses have continued to operate throughout this process and are helping other businesses in their business practice. Um, we're seeing um, more people looking at setting up their own businesses. Um, and so, we, you know, the, the objectives are very much around focusing on those areas where we think we can make the biggest difference post COVID-19 and, and try and you know, be in a better place than we were at, at, at the start of, of the pandemic by supporting those areas that can, can grow. Uh, so if we can move on to the next one, please. So the, the plan is focused around these key themes, um, people, partners and places, and then cross-cutting themes of environment inclusive economy. So nobody uh, will be surprised to see that we've got in you know, a climate emergency running through all of the themes that we're trying to do here. Um, you know, we've seen significant improvements in our environment, uh, our air quality um, during the last four months. And we need to try and sustain some of those improvements and carry that through the plan. Um, four key themes that you'll see there are job creation that focus on young people that I, that I talked about earlier, where we're seeing a significant impact in, in the area. Digital inclusion, uh, Carecles is coming out very high in statistics of people that are, are, are suffering from digital exclusion um, and we're, we're trying to you know to address that with with our colleagues uh, at the college the university and, and with city fiber to see how we can make sure that every every resident is able to learn from home uh, work from home and, and that they've got you know the, the right digital connectivity and and to focus on an make sure that we've got the involvement of, of our voluntary and community sector in, in helping us to make sure we've got that inclusive economy approach. So just move on to the next slide, please. So um, the, the cabinet are focused on how we can use our resources um, to, to um, best, you know, to, to in the best way for it to help us grow and to get out of the um, impl impacts that we've, that we're seeing through COVID-19. And so the, the 
be a £40 million economic recovery fund. And that, that's not new money. Um, it is repurposing some of that um, funding that we've already got available through our property investment fund and our startup and retention fund, but also looking at how we can reprofile our capital program um, and prioritise that to focus on the schemes that will have the biggest impact on the areas that have, have, have suffered the most um, through this pandemic periods. So we're doing a piece of work at the moment with our, our colleagues in finance and to look at that capital programme and to, to identify those schemes where actually they really need public sector investment to help them go forward and, and, and which are the projects that actually the, 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 the market is better placed to do. Um, but obviously, you know, given some of the viability challenges that we have for some of our capital project schemes, we, we need to think which is the ones where we should invest that will in, unlock that private sector investment and that wider investment from, from government. Uh, and if, if I just start to move on through the next ones now, this is just to go give a, a little bit more detail on, on some of the themes. So the, the business theme um, is... The, the intelligence that we're, we're getting back through the business theme is that there isn't a coherent business support offer um, across the area. That So the, the, the business support scheme that is currently managed through the combined authority and we have growth managers that are placed in all of the local authority areas is only really scratching the surface. And there's still some confusion out on the patch about where businesses need to go to for that, you know, that one place where they can go and 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 find a way into the business support that's available. So we were looking at how we can develop something that's very carefully focused, working with the Chamber and with the Federation of Small Businesses. Um, I think there will be similarities across the region and, it, it, you know, we, a West Yorkshire approach will probably come come to the, the front at, at some point but at the moment we need to focus on what's right for Kirklees and how we can work with those local businesses. Um, we are um, forecasting from the intelligence that we've been receiving and some of the inquiries we've been receiving from residents of businesses that we, ha we are expecting to see an increase in new business starts um, and so we want to make sure that we've got the right support in place to help those people to start businesses and to uh, make sure they've got the right support, the right accommodation premises to grow them going forward. Uh, if I can move on to the, the next slide. So um, I've touched on employment and the impact on, on youth. Um, and one of the things that that uh, again, that from the intelligence is telling us that a lot of the apprenticeship places that have been offered that were due to start in September this year have now been lost. We've got some local training providers that have um, decided to cease trading. So we, we had one that ceased trading earlier this week, which left 80 young people without um, a training provision in place from the start of September. So we, we're working to look at how we can support those young people um, into alternative training provision, but how we can make sure that they don't lose the apprenticeship places that they had uh, initially been promised post, be, prior to COVID-19. Um, We've already piloted some of this through um, KNH and Kirklees College have also been piloting some apprenticeship schemes. So it's looking at how we can bring that together in an, into an apprenticeship hub so that we employ these young people through the hub and then make sure they get the appropriate training, the appropriate skills through through the right, the right placement. Um, obviously, the government scheme that was announced last night is going to be uh, a big help to us in that 16 to 24 age group um, in, in, in encouraging businesses through the support that is there available to take some of those people on and to give them that work experience. But also, we've got to be conscious that it's not just young people that are affected by this. It is across all age groups. So we don't want to just focus on 16 to 24. We need to be making sure that we're upskilling um, and supporting those people that are that are 24 and above that have also suffered um, employment impacts through through this through this period. So if I can move on to places, please. Um, so I touched on this earlier. Is is through the capital program is looking actually which of those blueprint projects um, will give us the biggest impact and will um, encourage 
other investment into into our towns. Um, we're already seeing new funding coming through. So we've we've had um, a, a shovel ready project for accelerating um, some of our projects that can deliver before March 2020. That's come through from the government in the last couple of weeks. We've had some um, additional funding that's coming through the town deal focused on Dewsbury. Again, that needs to be committed and spent before March 2021. So we're, we're really doing quite a close review of some of those blueprint projects to see actually which of those can we deliver in that period that are going to make the biggest difference to those towns. Um, Obviously, the blueprints that we've um, that we've adopted are focused on Huddersfield and Dewsbury, but we also recognise that they're not our only only towns in in Kirkley. So, looking at how we can support so the you know put programmes in place to support other towns in in Kirklees as well, um, in in recovering from from the impacts of of COVID nineteen. Um, Naz and his team are, are looking at the housing delivery programme and looking at how we can accelerate some of those housing delivery programmes. And obviously with the announcements yesterday around the, the stamp duty, we need to maximise the opportunity of that and 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 try and um, create a, a more vibrant housing market. Uh, if I can move on to the next one, please. Again, um, I touched a little bit on this earlier. Is, is climate emergency is is running right through all of all of these projects, and um, with the things that we're already had in delivery are the White Rose Forest, and we've got some additional funding coming in for for that program. Now we've um, been through some of our our uh, land availability and looked at where we can allocate land for planting to help accelerate the delivery of some of that White Rose Forest project. Um, We've you have seen in the towns that we've reallocated road space for walking and cycling on back of some of the support that we've been given from 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 government in putting that connectivity program back into place and looking at new ways and more efficient ways of moving people around our towns in in a, in a safe way, um, and and really looking at um, you know where we can build in resource efficiency um, and and carbon reduction into into our business practices and into into some of our projects. And if I can move on, please, to our last slide. And last but not least, obviously, everything we do is really important that it is done in an inclusive in a, an inclusive way um, and we are working with our partners um, across Kirklees to make sure that we can reach out to as many people as possible and and we know that you know the people that were already the furthest removed from the employment market are actually now even more disadvantaged and um, we need to make sure that we're reaching those people with what we're doing with our projects with our support offer with our our employment and skills offer and, and giving everybody the best opportunity they can going forward. Um, and I think that is all I want to say, so I'm, I'm open to questions. And I've got Jonathan Nunn here with me as well uh, to support on any some of the detail. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Angela. Um, and I've already got some uh, members who have indicated that they want to speak. Just a reminder, members, to just put uh, speak in the chat function um, and I will do a running order of, of, um, of members' um, opportunities to speak. Thank you very much. So we'll start off with Councillor Bold. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thanks to Angela for that presentation. Um, you have my sympathies in having to present that on behalf of cabinet because a lot of that is disappointing you know when we look at people places and partners um it was disappointing to me how far down the presentation came uh, the green recovery they you know things like that should be first and foremost active travel is an afterthought in kirklees and whereas in many other areas it's been at the forefront of people's minds and uh, movements, we've seen how other proactive authorities um, have redistributed road space and have encouraged active travel. With Kirklees, we're only getting it through in a minimalistic form in tranche two. They talk about uh, allowing some different 
the use of the Huddersfield and Dewsbury town centres without paying any attention to how do the vulnerable users get there. And that's been raised time and time again. £40 million pounds of spending, again, prioritised for Huddersfield and Dewsbury. And then we heard a bit about Batley and Cleckheaton. No, no mention of places that I represent, like Murfield, which is one of the vibrant centres. And I make no apology for saying, looking at Councillor Taylor for smiles, is the only place in Kirklees with a direct link to London on a train service. You should be using these things as an asset. You know, anywhere else you look at Leeds and Wakefield, when they have a direct connection to the capital, it is marketed as an asset. In Kirklees, it's ignored. Looking at uh, figures that we see coming about, for other projects in active travel are talking about an economic return on investment in a three to one ratio. Uh, and that's not including things like the health benefits that people get. So why aren't we looking uh, at that? I think we need to see, we've, you've talked about um, staff working on regeneration and building. We need to see stronger challenge of Kirkley staff to the claims of developers. The other week at, at planning, a developer claimed that uh, a site in Murfield was going to be generating half a million pound in business rates. Well, that was incorrect. And because of the structure of the planning committee, we weren't allowed to challenge that. That uh, site is an economic zone and Kirklees will see no benefits for at least five years from that because the rates will go to West Yorkshire. And as we know, we get very little back when you look at what Leeds and Bradford are, are stitching up between them. Um, network rail, Transpan and route upgrade was mentioned. Are there any agreements in place as to what Kirklees is getting in terms of local jobs, apprenticeships, or uh, facilities on site? Yeah, there's uh, Hill House, as you, as you know, Chair, Hill House is an excellent place to have sidings for, uh, for the works yards for Transpennine Route, which would then bring with it the ancillary benefits that the staff would either relocate to the area or be spending money in the local economy. Um, Angela mentioned the, uh, the Cabinet's limited uh, approach to active travel. And can we have some clarity? Because before the Cabinet report was reported on in the examiner, they were already saying there was going to be a U-turn on delivering Huddersfield and that Cabinet might be scrapping the limited measures that they'd already put in place for cycling in Huddersfield Town Centre. And I wish staff would be more proactive in, active in the asset transfers. They're still trying to tie community groups up with leases in Murfield for things like our memorial uh, ground, whereas asset transfer would put everything with the community group. They wouldn't be beholden to Kirk Lees. So again, my sympathy for with Angela for having to present that on behalf of Cabinet, but it's very disappointing and I hope that we can see some more steps forward. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Um, just, just a reminder, um, panel members to turn your cameras on. Um, I don't know if you're having a problem with your camera, Councillor Bolt, but if you could turn it on, that would be brilliant. Um, Angela, do you want to respond? Um, I think well, I don't know if any of the cabinet members want to come in, but I've taken note of those comments, and and um, obviously this is in draft format at the moment, um, and I will be picking up um, the points the points that have raised, and some of it might be the way I've presented it because active travel is is quite prominent um, to us in 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 what we're doing, and it is quite important to us. Um, so I think some of it might just be in the order in, in which I've presented it. But I just want to assure that, you know, that we are obviously considering um, active travel as part of, of all of our regeneration work and, and cycle, you know, improved cycling and pedestrian access, working very close with Network Rail on the Transpennine Rail upgrade and looking how we can maximise the benefit for Kirklees through that. Um, it's not without its challenges, um, but we, you know, we're, we're very clear on on what we want to achieve from it, and we will continue to pursue that. Okay, thank you. I think a couple of cabinet members want to come in and respond, so I'll call Nahid first, and then um, Rob. So, Councillor Mather. Okay. Do you want us to come on the uh, camera, or just leave it like this? I think it might be helpful to come on camera while you're speaking. Okay. All right. Um, 
So that was a big bucket load of things that Councillor Bolt just came and landed. Uh, I'd like to reassure him that as Angela had said, that this draft plan is an ever-changing landscape. It's fluid and it will be added to. Uh, things will be aligned with our existing uh, plans, i.e. the uh, uh, blueprint and the uh, local plan. Uh, things will also be aligned to all of the funding um, that's being um, announced by the government and West Yorkshire uh, WICA. Um, we will also be looking toward, uh, looking ahead that we're going to be in we are in discussions over the devolution deal and in in relation to the cabinet is already saying in the examiner there will be u-turns there will be we are doing things in a phased manner around active travel you cannot deliver infrastructure overnight we are doing it in a phased manner there will be no u-turns other than the fact that we are trialing things and things that will work there will be there are currently consultations to see what's working best and ensuring that whatever uh, we we keep in place is what serves the needs of the residents and the businesses uh, we want to regenerate our town centers and you know we mustn't forget we are in a pandemic and there is no matter how hard we try to bat, there, is, there, are, there are situations beyond us that we may want to uh, um, uh, deliver tomorrow, but we can't because everybody else is trying to, to do the same thing. But let me reassure you, in Kirklees, we're not sitting twiddling our thumbs. We are innovating and trying to make sure that whatever uh, is delivered isn't duplicating, is of good standards, uh, is something that's uh, required and needed and does align with the um, funding regimes that we have, um, both uh, at, uh, at a local level, uh, at a regional level, and whatever funding the government is making available. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mother. I'll bring in Councillor Walker now, but Councillor McBride, if I could bring you in later, because I just want to give members a chance to ask questions. It's Councillor Walker. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to follow up some of the comments that um, have, have just been made. Um, as Martin knows, I am a strong supporter of active travel and have been for a number of years. I've been extremely heartened by the impact that Tim Lawrence, who's in the meeting, has made as part of his new role promoting um, travel, managing travel within Kirklees. I think Martin's a little bit unfair, really, um, in terms of his comments, as, as he will know the timescale to put together plans for the first tranche of money that was coming through from the wiki committees that he's part of had a very short time scale and we did manage to put some plans together focused on Dewsbury and Huddersfield and many of those have been put into um, action the the, the the work's already taken place some of them because I think of the speed in which the plans have been put together have had to be modified a little bit as we're going along. And as uh, Councillor Mather says, it will take some time for some of those really to come fully to fruition. Following on though, with the tranche two monies, there's a lot of consultation taking place. So um, along with um, Tim, I've been involved in discussions with local councillors, looking at things like greenway projects, talking about how we can make those happen. They're really important in terms of getting people from the outlying areas into town centres. So for example, last week, we were looking at the greenway from Meltham, um, towards Huddersfield. There have also been discussions with groups who are particularly promoting things like cycling and walking. So I, I 
think we're actually doing a lot. I think we're doing the right thing in talking to people, working with people in terms of putting plans together for the future. And I think this is just one element of the economic plan, um, but it shows how we can successfully work with partners to put, put together a plan that will be successful and will make a difference to the citizens of Kirklees. Right, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Walker. I'm just going to try and bring some of the other members in before um, allowing um, um, sort of responses, if that's OK. So, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chair. Um, quite a number of questions. They're a bit all over the place, so I do apologise. Firstly, I'd like to thank Angela for the presentation. I guess when you realise that the uh, the Chancellor was making an announcement the day before this meeting, it's kind of, it's not the most helpful thing, is it? Because everything kind of gets thrown up in the air anyway, doesn't it? So um, I'm sure the team are busily working away, trying to understand what the impact that's all going to have on, on us here in Kirklee. So, but I guess whenever you do this presentation, it's moving, isn't it? So, um, but but thank you for that. I do I do have a number of number of questions. We we talk about repurposing money and reprofiling the capital programme. Um, that gets me um, slightly worried um, because obviously the capital programme has been um, put together and has an impact on the costs of raising that capital, which reflects in the um, medium term financial plan for the council. So I'm assuming all that's up in the air. Would like to understand that because presumably the capital projects we had in plan had a return on those investments that we were making. Now, if we're repurposing that money, that suggests those returns aren't going to be realised or other returns will be realised. And we need to understand um, whether it's through here or through corporate scrutiny, um, which I also sit on, um, what that impact is likely to be in financial terms of changing our mind about how we're going to use the capital funds that we have available. So that's that's my first point, really, um, a bit of a worry. Um, I also have a bit of a worry about how the property, property fund has or is planning to be used. One of the things I'm picking up, and I know that the university are one of our co core partners, but there are concerns that there may be falling roles at universities across the country, not just in Huddersfield. Um, there is a lot of money being spent on increasing student accommodation in central Huddersfield and a lot of money being banked on, you know, the the student pound. If we're going to see numbers falling, have we considered what that impact is? And also, if we are lending money, as we have done for the co-op building to be converted into student flats, have we had a look at the viability of that? And if we're if we're exposed do we understand what the impact may be um, of potentially one of the outcomes may be that um, rental rental costs may fall for student accommodation, which would be great for students that are here. But obviously, does that impact then on the um, financial viability of some of these companies that are building all of these super wonderful flats across Huddersfield? So I think we need to be not just looking at what we can do to, to boost the economy, but what are the potential downsides of what we thought was going to happen and what may now happen as a result of things changing through the pandemic? Um, on a similar line, office accommodation is another area that is vulnerable. So have we started looking at that? Because we're all working from home at the moment um, and the expectation is a number of people will continue, even if it's only partly to work from home and what the expectation is nationally there's a shrinkage in the need for office accommodation. So again, is there surplus office accommodation across Kirklees? Have we thought about the impact that may have? And again, I don't know how much of it we own, but again, that there'll be impact on rental costs there, presumably as well. It may be that as a council, we want to shrink our own footprint in terms of the number of buildings that we use for accommodation at the moment. And have we thought about what's going to happen with those buildings and the impact that may have on those those communities, if we close a building, even just you know the local sandwich shop or something like that. So we need to be we need to be looking at that. My other worry is there was a lot of talk about accelerating things, um, and again it's probably more corporate scrutiny where I do this, but um, we don't have a very good reputation for delivering on time. 
and that's usually because we have a limited number of skilled professionals within the council that have the ability to manage and deliver large scale projects. So do we really have the capacity to accelerate some of these things? Because I'm not sure we've got the skill sets within the council to enable us to accelerate them. We were already looking to recruit to enable us to deliver what the original plan was. So how are we going to deliver it more of it and faster with the, with the same skilled people? So I think that that's that's a worry for me. Um, well, there was mention of White Rose Forest, which I'm a, a huge supporter of. And there was some talk about we've been looking at places where we can increase planting trees. Um, I'm not aware anybody's spoken to any of the ward councillors in my ward about this, and yet we're one of geographically one of the largest wards and it's and it's a big sort of, you know, green area. So I'm a little concerned. I'm not sure who they've been talking to, but putting councils at the heart of things and looking at place based approaches doesn't feel like that's being done with White Road Rose Forest at the moment, or certainly not in the Kirk Burton ward. Um, my other question is, there was no mention of MPs here. Um, and we need to make sure that we are very linked in with what MPs are trying to do, not just government MPs, opposition MPs as well. It doesn't really make any difference, but they will have their own priorities. They will be banging the drum about particular issues. I heard my local MP yesterday, he was responding to the, the Chancellor's statement and he was talking about the Penniston line. He was talking about the A644, is it Huddersfield Road, Martin? But the, the road, the, the main road through through Murfield. He was talking about the Flockton Bypass. So these are issues that he's promoting and he's pushing and talking to the government about. So if we're not talking to the MPs, potentially we've got the MPs saying these are the priorities and Kirklees Council with a different list of priorities, which is not going to help us get the right result and get the right responses and support from from the government. Um, and then and then finally. Um, just back on transport again, um, just before the pandemic kicked in, I was due to have a have a meeting about um, the transport strategy for Kirklees because I don't believe we've got one. Um, and it'd be interesting. It sounds like, Tim, it sounds like you're landing with that in your new role by the sounds of things. So I'll be coming talking to you. But one of the things that um, the local plan didn't do, and I've not seen anything that does do since, is actually look strategically at the whole of Kirklees and the linkages across the whole of Kirklees, not just into the West Yorkshire region, but we are we are very well placed to link into the South Yorkshire region and to the Greater Manchester region as well. Mm -hmm. And we need a transport strategy that looks at the strategic links across all of those areas. And I don't think that exists at the moment. And I will be continuing to bang the drum for the Penniston line. We talk about um, you know, the, the Trans Pennine. Mm. I'm looking north south as well as east west. And I don't hear anything about that yet again. And I must I must be like a broken record at Cabinet. And poor Peter, I mean Peter can speak in a minute, but Peter knows this, don't you, Peter? I keep banging on about this because every document that seems to get produced by the council forgets about it. And again, there was no mention of it in the economic strategy. And actually linking Huddersfield through to Sheffield and Barnsley as well as across to Leeds is really, really important. There are an awful lot of people in the south of the borough that commute south or west towards Manchester, and we need to be recognising those communities as well. Um, and then a final one, um, and Rob, you might want to, Councillor Taylor. Yeah, um, Rob, you might want to pick this one up. Um, when we talk about active travel, I've been banging on for nearly two years now to try and get a bridleway upgraded in my ward, which would link to a station to enable people to, to use public transport to get into Huddersfield. And I seem to just keep bang on about it and not really getting anywhere. So be happy to pick up stretch gates for me, which I have had costed and I got the money through the public realm funding, but it hasn't happened yet. I would appreciate something happening on that. Thank you. I'll shut up now. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Taylor. No, thank you for that. There's, there's a lot to unpick there. So if I bring in Councillor McBride first, and you mentioned Councillor Walker, and I know Councillor Mather has also indicated that she wants to respond. If everyone can just um, um, think about time, if that if that's OK. So Councillor that's McBride. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, John, you, you throw me the kitchen sink in there, and I do recognise... The, some of the very significant uh, problems you highlight. The, 
It is quite frightening when we learn that the character of office work fundamentally will change, that the transport system is going to be uprooted in a way, and that the, the character of work is going to, be change, going to change. Now, we cannot resolve all those problems overnight. We have certainly got to take account of it in, a, in future development. But believe me, we have. And if I think just of our two major towns, there are seven, I stress, seven major schemes in Huddersfield alone, most of which cost at least £7 million. Pounds. That's over £50 million pounds to be spent on in Huddersfield alone. And that will link the bus station to the rail station. It will give you a linkage which will go all the way from the university and out to Lockwood and, on, and also onto um, to Manchester Road. It will be a link straight through the town on New Street. It will be links with Crosschurch Street. And so, in other words, the fundamentals of a transformation of this town. And there is comparable development proposed for... Um, but for uh, Dewsbury, if I think in terms of the fact we bought the arcade and our plans to develop it and soon, additionally, £8 million pound to be spent. And again, within 18 months, it will start on the, um, uh, on, the, on the new market, the open market site. And of course, the college opens in, Sept in September. We, what, this is 10 years of investment which will be coming to fruition. Also, we're intending to transform the character of the, the road system in Dewsbury to reflect that opening up of that whole area. So you are very quickly going to see a transformation in those two towns. But it's not solely those two towns. There are major plans for Barclay, for Cleckheaton and Home Firth. Currently, there's more evidence of what's going to happen in Home Firth uh, that's available. That's a five million pound scheme, essentially again based on roads. But there are transformational pro uh, proposals, and also we've said within the local money, we are allocating money to the smaller wards that are not the big town centres to ensure there is a localised regeneration program in those areas, which will include your ward certainly, um, uh, John. It will not uh, be provided a, by a, a bypass, as you've been promoting for so, for so long, because the logic does not justify it. It simply transfers the problem d uh, down the road. But the issues you refer to are fundamentally being addressed, mainly in terms of road schemes, but essentially in the two main towns, a complete reconfiguration of those towns, redevelopment of those towns to give them a chance to live and breathe. And ultimately, a program which leads out to literally every ward um, in Kirklees. So this is the starting point. In my lifetime, I, I've never seen anything remotely like this. And there is nobody alive in Huddersfield or Dewsbury who's ever seen a program of this nature and on, on, on this scale. And this was planned before the pandemic. And it's going to carry on. And it's been accelerated by virtue of the, um, the pandemic. But to suggest that we haven't done any thinking about this, it's just completely absurd. But Martin, I come to expect that of you. Mm -hmm. Councillor McBride, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, if, you, if there's any viewers, you might notice that Councillor McBride's we've got we've got a bit of problem with his camera. So it's not the brown sauce talking. It is is, <laughs> is Councillor McBride. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, as you can imagine, we're going to have some technical issues. Councillor Walker, do you want to? quickly respond because um, Councillor Taylor mentioned yourself as well and then we'll move on to the next uh, panel member. Councillor Walker are you there? I'll tell you what, what we'll do is we'll move on to the next panel member and then we'll bring in Council Walker. Might, might be a few um, technical hitches there. Um, Council Mavis, did you want to quickly come in and then I want to bring in Ailey? Yes, thank you. Um, so basically, uh, John, you made a very thoughtful input. And, you know, I wrote these words whilst you were speaking. We're all anxious, we're all worried. I've never lived through a pandemic. There will be delay because of the pandemic. 
we have had and we will continue to have capacity issues. And it's change. We're going to change in the way we work. And we have been already taking account of all of the things that you said, the shrinkage, the office space, the CO2 emissions, the climate change, uh, the university, how we're reprofiling our fund, the monies looking to the future when it runs out, the money tree no longer bears any fruit, what will happen, all of those things can I reassure you are things that the cabinet and the senior management team are addressing daily and all day long and you I think was it you or, or uh, Councillor Bolt who said we don't have a transport strategy and yes we're working on that too so please be reassured that any delay that may be caused there will be further delays because of the pandemic, because everything stopped and it's now beginning to revel up and everybody's looking to be doing similar things and devolution will throw other things into the mix. And that's why this recovery plan is called a draft that will be an ever-changing state. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mather. I'm going to bring in Ailey now. <clears throat> Hi, um, I think uh, my my point is just to, uh, well, it, it's um, potential continuation of Councillor Taylor's point around understanding impacts. So I think um, there's quite a lot of information about uh, general impact and we did hear about apprenticeships, but I think it would be good if there were some data and evidence around, uh, more data and evidence around the impact. So particularly which which areas or sorry, which industries are being most affected by the pandemic in, in Kirklees, uh, which locations, and I think the location specifically uh, will help inform things like the transport strategies and who we should be moving around and which skills. So I think we've talked about areas that we'd like to develop, but do we already have the people um, with those skills in Kirklees or not? Um, so I think around the, the evidence and essentially I think the evidence around this would help uh, to understand which industries we should be prioritising rebuilding and where uh, people should, and businesses, industries should be encouraged to divest and also help us to understand what opportunities are available. We might find that we have a, a large workforce in one area that's suddenly unemployed, etc. And um, I, I'm assuming that there's probably been quite a lot of thinking around this, but um, it would be good to have a, a bit more evidence, data and statistics on this and how to direct resources. Yeah, thank you, Ailey. That's a very good point. Angela, did you want to say anything on that? Uh, yeah, I can come back in on that one. Um, we have we have got we're, we're still gathering evidence, but we have got some quite substantial evidence now. Um, we've got some collated at West Yorkshire, and some collated by the chambers, but we've also done a, a local business survey, um, which we've just analysing the results from from that business survey. We've had a really good response to it, so that has given us a really good feel for those areas that have had the biggest impact um, and and. Some, some of that, the things that are coming out the strongest are the manufacturing industry and those industries that supply to the hospitality and retail sector, um, they've taken quite a hit locally. But we have got that evidence and we are compiling all that data now. So the plan that you've got is informed by, by that evidence. Thank you, Angela. Um, so next on my list, I've got Councillor Megatroyd. Uh, yeah, hiya. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Angela, for your presentation. And I've read the draft plan, and uh, I have to say, I think um, Councillor Bolt's um, characterisation of this as disappointing is actually unfair and inaccurate, in my opinion, anyway, because I actually think the draft plan sets out some very important um, work streams and paths forward. But if they're developed well, will actually make a real difference and uh, you know rather than um, obviously this is a vast uh, topic and we could you know give long speeches for hours on end or, and but i'll try and avoid stream of consciousness and uh, just kind of try and concentrate on some specific issues uh, because obviously if we're going to make this work 
actually have to identify some tacticals um, relate to specific areas of the plan. So um, first of all, I just wanted to pick up on and welcome the emphasis in the plan on, on uh, cooperatives and uh, social enterprises uh, as very important actually, because all the empirical evidence is that these fix wealth locally and are much more resilient than, than uh, other sorts of businesses. Uh, and they also fit within our place-based approach as an authority. So um, I just wanted to ask, as someone, I've got kind of hands-on experience of, of developing co-ops. I was on the board of the Valley Wind Wind Farm Project, and I'm the chair of Cooperative Carecombe Valley. And uh, I have to say, based on that experience, it, to develop a co-op is a difficult and an arduous task and it requires skills uh, and perseverance. And I, my question really is, has thought been given at possibly at a regional level to, to get economies of scale, um, to have some sort of cooperative development agency, which, uh, which could actually help communities and act as an intermediary with communities to help them develop co-ops, because it's a big ask of to to get ordinary people to kind of quickly get those level of skills required so that'd be my first specific question uh but just moving on to the second one um so the climate emergency working party one of its recommendations uh was for a working group to be developed uh that involved key stakeholders so I'm thinking here of educational providers and um, obviously we've got some great businesses like the Green Building Store uh, in my own ward. And um, the idea was to actually develop uh, skills uh, around the green economy. And this is obviously extremely relevant to young people uh, in particular, but it also ties in with the need to build back better. So um, really my question is around that, um, that recommendation that was made in the report, um, how, what steps are being taken or will steps be taken to actually implement that? Because I think there's a tremendous opportunity there if, uh, if we reach out and we've got a lot of skills in, the, in this borough that we can utilise in a partnership approach, as we recommended. Um, so my third, um, my third um, question really relates to, so uh, colleagues have mentioned about planting trees on council land, and I think, you know, any sensible person would support that because it's empirically proven to, to make a difference uh, in terms of carbon. Um, but there's another sort of growth that we could plant on council-owned land as well and that could be but, but would cut carbon and that could be low carbon and passive house housing schemes and again the council uh, the climate emergency working party recommended made some recommendations around this and I understand that there are some initiatives in places like Home Firth uh, I think it was an eco homes project which is uh, looking to develop um, you know eco homes so uh, um, Basically, again, there seems to be an opportunity there to actually do something real and to use council land, uh, you know, in a way that, that not, will not only create local wealth, but would also uh, would also do something about the climate emergency. So three specific questions there, please, Angela. So um, I'll shut up. Hi, yes, so on the um, developing cooperative, this has been captured in the West Yorkshire Recovery Plan um, and the uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority have put in the, their ask for, for shovel-ready projects that has gone into government for um, further funding to support business growth and business support and enterprise and there is a, there is a theme within that that funding request that will support the development of cooperatives so it, that has been picked up at a regional level um, 
in terms of the climate emergency working party, um, obviously we've been we're slightly delayed on, on moving some of those recommendations forward, but I can assure you they are moving forward. Um, and we had hopes that that partnership meeting would have convened and, and taken place. But obviously, again, that, you know, that, that has Councillor May, the may want to comment on that, but it, that group is being formed um, and will be meeting as, as soon as we're able to do that. Um, so just, just again, assurance that, that that is progressing. In terms of the um, passive house and eco homes, um, is it OK if I bring my colleague Naz in, who I can see is on the call, who might be able to respond to that better than I can? Yeah, that's fine. If you want to come in, uh, Naz, on that point. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to just uh, add to that, you know, so we've got some big schemes coming up, like the Bradley scheme, and it'd just be interesting to know what kind of place passive house can, can play in that. So, Naz... So um, I think it's right to say that we don't believe where the, the experts, picking up Councillor Taylor's point from earlier on, and that we require some advice and some help. So we're in the in the process of, uh, we've just agreed the, the brief uh, and we're about to commission, um, uh, send that brief out to commission a specialist consultant who can help us understand Passive House, our sites and where best in terms of orientation and um, there's a there's a, a high likelihood of us being able to make the impact that we're wanting to and achieve the passive house standard. <laughs> In that documentation, we are we are asking um, the consultants to also help us prepare um, a pilot scheme, uh, probably of about a hundred homes, at least of twenty of it of which should be um, uh, to passive house standards, so that we can test all the principles and and do some learning and evaluation from that. Because you're right, councillor. Up all, you know, we do have some uh, major sites in our ownership where, uh, if there's something that we can uh, develop that works uh, and is affordable, uh, then the, the the whole purpose of the pilot is to to understand how we might scale that up on our own land. Um, and and we have been engaging with um, um, a number of partners uh, local uh, that have already been mentioned to see what their aspirations are and how the uh, how the council might. Uh, play a role in enabling and support, perhaps uh, with uh, identifying the the right right piece of land that enables that that group uh, to to develop their eco home. So you know we're working with them on the basis of they'll come up with a business plan, um, which we will be able to look at and then think about how which land plays into that. So a number of different things going on, and of course on. Uh, in terms of some of the work that we're doing around the residential design guide, there, there's a there's a big theme in there around um, climate emergency and low carbon housing. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just quickly pick up John Taylor's point. Um, I think he's just asked about there there might have been some analysis done already on passive housing. Um, Locally, perhaps is no, it was, it was this uh, is, coming. Yeah. This is the policy. The policy. There used to be a policy committee of Kirklees, and I sat on it. And there was a whole. There was a working party that um, there was about four or five councillors were on. We spent a year doing a report that um, on passive housing. So we've got a whole shed load of stuff that's already been done on this. I don't know what's been done with it. Yeah. Can Can I come in as well, please? Yeah, yes, quickly, Richard. Yeah, I mean, just as a follow up, I, I would echo what uh, Councillor Taylor said. Um, I mean, there has been a tremendous amount of work done around passive housing, you know, as a technology. Um, and so, in that sense, it, given that we do have an emergency uh, here, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously, a question does have to be asked about scale and. Uh, and you know, uh, you know. So uh, yeah, I'd just say that. Okay, thank you. Nas, did you want to come back on that? I know um, Councillor Walker has also indicated to speak. Yeah, we, we did. We did use that work, uh, and we uh, we uh, tested a site uh, at Style Common in the Newsom Ward. Uh, we marketed the site. We invited tenders um, uh, to to deliver passive house. When the tenders came back, um, the um, the overall costs just just rendered the whole development unviable. They, were, they came in at, if I remember rightly, about 178k. And if you think about the, if we take pricing uh, in terms of uh, building indexa indexation at that point in time, it was approximately 25% higher than uh, you know a development should cost us. So uh, the view was we couldn't proceed with that. 
uh, which is why we're, we're essentially uh, some of the learning from that was well, perhaps that wasn't the right site in terms of its orientation and the ability to maximize things like solar gain and the like. And I, I, I'm in territory that I am no expert in, uh, so I'm going to stop there and uh, and not, not trip myself up in terms of terminology and, and the expertise that we're trying to buy in at the moment. Yeah, a very good point that we do um, get the right expertise and, and evidence on this. So, um, Councillor Walker, I think you indicated as well, and then I'll bring in the, the panel members. Thank you, Hartbury. Um, I just wanted to respond to some comments made earlier about, by Councillor Taylor, um, particularly about the White Rose Forest. And um, I do agree with him. I think it's really important that we do talk to councillors in every ward to look at the possibilities. Um, it's often not just about identifying council land, it's about local councillors perhaps knowing other landowners in a particular area who may be in really interested in getting involved in these schemes. Because of land ownership patterns, most of the trees that are planted are going to be planted on land by other people. So we've got the really big projects in the south, but the southwest of the borough, where we're working with people on land owned by people like Yorkshire Water and the National Trust. But it is really good to work with smaller partners as well. Um, there are other projects going ahead as well and things that we're looking at. So there's all sorts of thinking going on in the background. Just next week, we're talking to Moors for the Future, who are the, certainly in England, they're the big experts on moorland ecology. And we're looking at carrying out a very detailed peat survey, which will look at carbon sequestration and fire prevention, and also it will have links to flood, flood prevention. So this could be extremely important in terms of our response to the climate change emergency, because as you may be aware, there is more carbon sequestra sequestrated in our um, peat moorland than is actually sequestrated in all the forests in Germany and France put together. So it's extremely important and things like the fires when they happen, like the ones in Marsden last year, can release a lot of um, carbon as well as causing all sorts of other water pollution problems. So there are things going on where we are really looking to pioneer um, actions and move forward both with trees and other kinds of landscapes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Walker. I've got um, Councillor Eastwood and Andrew Bird. So if we take both your questions or and our comments together and then uh, we can get a response. So Councillor Eastwood, do you want to start? Okay, oh, you can hear me okay. Uh, yeah, the first question I've got is, uh, Thank you for the report, uh, much appreciated. Uh, as you say, it's a very fluid uh, state of affairs just at the moment and things will no doubt change tomorrow and the day after. Uh, my first point was uh, business support and it was mentioned that a lot of businesses had mentioned that information hadn't got out to them and what we're going to do differently to actually get that information out this time around. Uh, so that, that's the first point. Uh, the getting actively to work, be it walking or cycling. Uh, it's a fantastic idea. Uh, unfortunately, we've got, I don't know, decades of uh, underinvestment in such areas and it ain't going to happen overnight. Got to accept that. Uh, I do think that the changes that were made, particularly in Huddersfield Town Centre, came as a bit of a knee-jerk reaction and there wasn't enough engagement with local businesses as to how the changes might affect them. So I think we need to uh, increase that level of engagement with businesses. And uh, that was just about it, really. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Andrew, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of points, if I may. Firstly, um, just about the capital spending and reprofiling of it. I hope that reprofiling is going to emphasise that the, the the use of local workforces um, and maximising the amount of money that's spent locally. Because the danger of reprofiling and accelerating it is that we don't we aren't able to respond to, to, to that demand. Um, on the low, on the passive house side, um, one of the big issues with passive house is 
is the quality quality assurance on site and the technical skills of the people on site putting the, putting the houses together. Um, and that sort of training need, um, which feeds back into something I feel seems to be missing so far through a lot of the conversation that was in the presentation. The whole issue about young people and skills and linking that to the green economy. Um, there seems to be a lot to do there around energy conservation, use of open space, which could lead into skills for young people. And I've been a bit disappointed through the comments so far that we haven't really emphasised enough the needs of young people in all of this. They're take, they've taken a massive hit or will take a massive hit. They're employed in sectors which are disproportionately impacted by what we know about COVID-19 so far. And we really do need to focus our attention right in the centre on making sure that there are futures for them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure who wants to respond to this initially. Um, I don't know if a cabinet member wants to come in. Um, Angela, do you want to start? I can come in, yeah. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so business support um, and, and what we're going to do differently. Um, this is this is what we're working on with partners now. So um, you're probably aware of the Kirkley's Business Hub, I think, which was launched uh, before my time a couple of years ago. Um, we're, we're looking at how we can refresh that and make it a more proactive business support service rather than a reactive one and hope that people find us. So it's really about us engaging engaging better with business um, and um, starting to build that relationship with our businesses across the patch more directly and being much more proactive about the support offer that's going out there. But it's not just about the council, it's about how we work with partners and putting that out. Obviously, through the grants that we've been delivering, um, which we've, we, we've delivered over 8,000 grants to businesses, that has actually you know, built a new relationship with business, many businesses that we didn't have before. Um, and we need to, to, to maintain that relationship now and keep engagement with those businesses. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why the, the business survey that was just been out, we've had such a, a, a much better response to because that relationship is, ne is, is, is now in place. Um, in terms of engagement in the town centre, I think, um, you know, personally believe that that is that is really good now. We've got um, working really closely with the business improvement district um, in Huddersfield, who you know working really closely with all the businesses in the town centre. Um, obviously, there's been a, a challenging period of that where the businesses have not actually been in, um, and and so we you know it has been difficult to reach out to those that have been that have been closed. Um, Simon is is obviously going to talk about the blueprint on the agenda, and you know he'd talk about the resources that we've put into his team and. He's, he's, he's got people that are out on the patch working with businesses in the town centre every day now. Um, so I do hope that businesses do feel that they're more engaged in, in, in what we're doing in the town centre and our efforts that, that, that we're really, really making is quite strongly to consult and work with, with businesses locally. Um, in terms of the capital spend and the, the, the reprofiling, um, this is looking at the schemes, you know, it's not looking at changing the capital programme and moving away from some of those projects that we've committed to spend. It's looking at which of those do we need to bring forward, um, where being more, prioritising, being more focused on the areas of where we can make the biggest difference um, and where we, the public sector really needs to invest and how we can reprofile some of that capital programme to accelerate some of those schemes. Um, I'm going to Councillor Taylor mentioned uh, concerns about capacity um, in, to do that. We, we, we are building capacity in the team um, and Richard Hollinson's got, got in additional capacity in the project management team. Um, we've got additional capacity that's come into the corporate landlord function in, in terms of construction project management and those construction skills to help us focus on on the areas that we, we that we need to to be delivering on uh, you're absolutely right delivering is where you get in giving that confidence in in delivering is where we'll start to unlock further support from the combined authority and we need to we you know we've got schemes through 
through the system now that will be that are already starting um that will be um on the ground in in august of this year um and hopefully you know proving that we can deliver those on time and to budget will give more confidence um in, in our ability to be able to do that um just to pick up on the comment of young people um I, it, it has i do believe that it has got significant emphasis and um, it is our it, young people are all the way through our economic recovery plan and that is something that we're pushing really really strongly at a west yorkshire level and and yes there is that challenge that it's not just about young people that the um the, the impacts of COVID-19 are felt across all age groups, um, but we are really conscious that the biggest impact to us in Kirklees has been to that younger age group, um, and that is that is a priority focus area for us, which is why we're talking about the apprenticeship hub. It's why we're working really closely with uh, with Kirklees College and and with the university, um, and and looking at how and. And, and with C and K, how we can pick up and help some of those young people that have been directly affected through the loss of training provision and, and apprenticeships going forward. Thank you. I think um, both Councillor Mather and Councillor Watt have indicated that they want to speak. So if you want to quickly come in and then we'll move on to the, the blueprint. I just wanted to say, actually, Angela summarised it very well, that the provision, um, young people are at the heart of everything we're going to do, and we're going to do it in relation to partnerships and cooperation, so there is no duplication. And uh, skills, both, you know, we recognise the skills, we recognise uh, opportunities in relation to uh, climate change and a green economy. But we will do that to ensure that the existing providers and new providers coming forward are all taken on board rather than, say, have colleges and universities sitting there twiddling our thumbs and us reinventing the wheel. Um, so uh, I think going forward, it's all about partnerships and coordination and, and making sure that we're, we're providing the skills that are needed locally and that local economy, that circular economy has to be green, has to be clean and has to deliver to the needs of Kirklees residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Um, Councillor Walker, did you want to quickly come in as yeah, well? Yeah, I'll try and, be re try and be really quick. Yeah, um, I'm one of the Kirklees representatives on the C&K careers um, board and um, I'm really passionate about getting the right kind of support for young people both in terms of careers advice and guidance and also ensuring that the there is a really good range of high quality apprenticeships and other training schemes available for young people. I'm interested in the detail of the announcements that were made yesterday. So for example with career support, it's not at all cl clear whether this will apply to a local setup like our um, Calderdale and Kirklees Career Service, or whether it's going to be money aimed at the National Career Service. And all the work that's been done has shown how effective our local service is, where it's a provision where the people who are delivering it understand the local economies and have got really excellent um, links with both the education training side of things and with local employers. Um, I'm also worried about what will happen in terms of apprenticeship providers, because one of the issues locally with the problems that we had last week with one of our major providers in a major industry um, announcing that they're shutting down business is to do with the way apprenticeship providers are funded. And this is just something that is applied in normal times, but also it's applied in terms of the funding that's happened during the COVID crisis. So I think we're gonna to have to work there with national government, coming back to an earlier point, as well as working with our local providers to make sure we provide the best deal for our local people. And I do hope that government and our local MPs will um, respond to this. Okay, thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Councillor Walker. That's really helpful. Thank you, everybody, uh, for this discussion. I mean, just quickly for me, the, the, the slides show the scale of the problem, really. And when we're talking about 85% increase in UC universal credit claims and youth unemployment at 10.4%, quite clearly, this is a this is a big uh, big problem that we're going to have to have to deal with going forward. Personally, I be, believe there's a lot of um, commitment in this recovery plan, which is really good to see. But just to re reiterate some of the points of, of panel members, really, around um, the community wealth building point and just making sure that's that's emphasised as much as possible, because I think we are doing that work, but it's, the, the, it could do with some, a little bit more emphasis. The, um, the point around the evidence and, and modelling and projections is, is a really good one. And just, just to make sure that we are doing that and we're able to evidence our work. And um, generally, um, some of the points that have been made about the, the built environment and what we can do around uh, a new green deal new green deal or whatever we want to call it quite clearly there's there are some um, potentials there for us given some of the companies that we've got available locally so thank you so much angela for for the presentation i'm sure other panel members will join me in saying we want to thank you for all the work you've been doing and your colleagues throughout this crisis i know it's been a, a difficult time for all of you so thank you so much for everything you've done and and thank you for joining us thank you so we're going to move on to the huddersfield blueprint and we've got simon taylor here with us uh, to give us a presentation. So um, off you go, Simon. I don't know if you've got slides. Uh, I think Stephen's going to pop them up for you now. I'll yeah. hand over to you. Thank you, Chair. I hope, well, they, hopefully you can hear me. I'm not on mute, I don't think. Um, I'm sure you'll say if I am. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'll, um, I'm not driving the presentation, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it uh, as best as I, I can. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a year almost... Uh, just over a year now since we launched the um, Huddersfield Blueprint. Uh, we got quite a bit of uh, credit for the, the strength of that, that vision at that time. Um, it's really important to sort of set out right from the off. That was a 10-year plan. Uh, it's a 10-year well, vision, uh, and we need to set out our stall to, to deliver that. Um, we have, over the last year, uh, achieved quite a bit of progress on every single project that we we set out in in that uh, particular vision document, but a, a large number of them. And I think it's really important that we understand that part of the process is about securing funding. It's about building capacity. And I know there was a little bit of conversation in the uh, in the last item about capacity in the council to to deliver. Um, and also making some progress on on, on partnerships uh, and also helping to find additional funding streams that can deliver on some of the uh, blueprint projects. And a similar process has gone on in Dewsbury. That blueprint was launched much later, earlier this year, but there's still significant steps that we've been able to bring, bring forward. I think one thing I would say about um, both towns they are very firmly on national government's list. Um, for Huddersfield, we were successful in making a competitive bid for future high street fund status. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate what that means. We were uh, selected in the first 50 uh, towns to have that status. Uh, we're competing against three or 400 other local authorities for that. Uh, that's since been expanded, expanded to uh, about 100, but it's still no mean feat, which gives us access to, to funding. Uh, and I like to think that that was a, in part because we had a good vision and in part because we engaged with the right people involved in town centre regeneration. And on the Jewsby as well, we're more fortunate that Jewsby has been selected by government to receive uh, town fund status, and we're working through that process as as we, as we speak. So, two really quite successful platforms to to build build from. I think. Can you move on to the next slide, please? I just want to touch on capacity and resource. Um, we've been able to recruit program managers into the town centre team. Uh, in particular, we've got more resource now in, in Huddersfield to help deliver on two key, two key programmes that I'll come to. Um, but uh, overall, we've expanded our capacity 
to um, work in partnership with uh, an organisation called uh, Perfect Circle, who uh, are a consortium of sort of consultants. And they're helping us on sort of very te technical matters around structural design, around uh, <coughs> marketing and branding for sort of uh, a major uh, music venue uh, spaces. And they also provide expert advice on, on market provision as well. So we are accessing uh, a greater range of expertise to help us on this journey. journey. And I think importantly as well, we ought to say something about the funding streams. Uh, Future High Street Fund was the brand that the government came out with. We we can access that funding. And we've just submitted our recent bid for £11 million into that, that pro programme. Uh, and that's based on uh, Huddersfield and it's based on how we reconfigure a new market in the town. Future High Street Fund, Heritage Action Zone, we've already been uh, told that we are uh, going to get a million pounds into that programme. That programme centres on St George, George, St George's Square buildings, in particular the George Hotel and also estate buildings. So uh, we are quite pleased that we're in that, that programme. Incidentally, the HAS programme looks like it might increase and we've just been asked to uh, submit uh, some evidence so that Historic England can, can help us access another million pounds in, in funding uh, for that particular programme. And that's as a result of acquiring the George Hotel and a partnership with uh, the Rugby League National Museum. So things do start to drop in place once you show some progress. The town fund is a fund available to Dewsbury only, uh, and that's worth £25 million, and we're in the running for that. We've got the latest guidance to take that forward. Um, and on top of that, Richard Hollington's team, uh, which Tim Lawrence, who's also on this sort of item, is part of, uh, have been working up um, bids for what is known as the Transforming Cities Fund uh, programme. Uh, and we know that we're, we can access uh, 39 million pounds for various works in around the two 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 centres. Uh, and the last one on my sort of list there is local growth fund. We'd already been accessing some funding from the West Yorkshire Combined Authority to develop programmes around uh, the station. That's worth about 10 million pounds. That's in Huddersfield. Uh, and more recently, we've been asked to submit a bid to uh, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority for shovel ready projects. Uh, we found out today that uh, our scheme for both the George Hotel and Dewsby Arcade is going to be put forward for additional funding. That's worth about £2 million across the two, two, two projects. So we're doing quite well on the funding. It's um, quite time consuming at times, but it's a really important part of the whole uh, regeneration programme that we're trying to, to operate. Can I just move on to the next next slide? This is just really a flavour of how we are divided up our programme. We're concentrating heavily on Huddersfield Station Gateway, uh, the St Peter's area of um, uh, Huddersfield Town Centre as well. That picks up the old post office uh, and the open market. And of course, we're putting a lot of effort into progressing our plans around the Queensgate area and also in Dewsbury. We've got some cross-cutting themes that we're developing, working with our highway service on a on-street public realm programme, uh, and that's already started to gather some momentum. Uh, and also the housing team are looking at how that housing offer in each town can be can be delivered. Because in both programmes, um, both visions actually, uh, we have set out the need for more people living in the town. So we need to understand how that's going to be delivered. Governance, Cabinet, of course, heavily involved in decision making. We have a town centre programme board and we're starting to develop a series of steering groups or sort of smaller programme boards to support that. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, I just wanted to touch on some of the key, key programmes and projects. It's impossible to go through everything today. Um, given the time frame, but I wanted to pick out some of the highlights. Maybe before I sort of dive into this, probably worth setting out some of the other things that we have done. There's lots of other bits of strategy work that's gone alongside this. We've started, we've had a, 
the public art strategy for both towns agreed that that will be rolled out over uh, a number of years. Uh, and also, we have also invested into um, sort of additional police in the towns, two big steps forward for both towns in terms of tackling some of the antisocial behaviour. And in Huddersfield, that came about uh, on the 1st, 1st of July. Jews we all follow on quite quickly after that. And that's been a matter of piecing together the funding, recruitment for in, in, in the police service and getting those officers uh, operational. But that's a, a big strand of both visions is to improve uh, the safety of the, of, the, of the towns. And I think we've made a, a big effort to work with the police to bring that forward. But on Station Gateway, probably the most sort of um, iconic part of Huddersfield Town Centre anyway, it picks up the George Hotel and the station itself and always also stretch that out to to uh, to the bus bus station at Huddersfield. Can you just move on to the next slide, please? Um, just want to talk to you about the bus station, which is a project that when we went out to launch the blueprint, it was part of our aspiration. It's moved from aspiration now into something that has uh, a funding stream attached to it. Our Transforming Cities package will contribute £7 million to that particular project that was announced just before lockdown in March. Uh, and we have to go through the various business case uh, phases with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Uh, we submitted uh, the first stage of that, our strategic outline case, uh, on the 1st of July. Uh, and our next uh, business case deadline, which is unfortunately covered up by uh, the, the team's bar here, which I can't quite see. Um, I think it's actually the 1st of January. Okay, I can't see that. Um, your strategic outline yeah, case was submitted 1st of first July. Of June, yeah, and, and then, then you've got outline business case January 2021. Okay, okay, January 2021 for the, for the next phase. So first step done working on the second phase, and that looks like we'll be on track for delivery in 2023. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Um, Huddersfield Station Gateway uh, effectively uh, in captures uh, the George Hotel and the estate buildings. Of course, there's been lots of press of late about the George Hotel. Um, our consultation process after the launch of the blueprint uh, very strongly favoured that the council acquired the George Hotel. It uh, helped also to bring back a museum presence in, in the hotel at the, at the same time. I think we've, um, we've now achieved both of those sort of key objectives. The paperwork on the George Hotel uh, will be signed off in the next couple of weeks. Everybody knows where we are with the Rugby League uh, Cares organisation. We are now the successful bidders into acquiring the National Rugby League Museum in that building, which is a significant step forward for the town. Uh, it attaches uh, a lot of weight to our sort of heritage background. Uh, and I think it's really good for the regeneration of the town itself. Um, we have secured additional funding since that announcement, which is really, really useful. Um, and also we are progressing, even today, I've been working on this today, the first package of works for the hotel, which is the remedial works, which effectively is stripping out uh, and making safe that building and providing the platform for us to provide the muse museum. This will be an ongoing process. Um, probably over the next sort of four years you will see various stages of this project being delivered but that first step is already in place by getting a very significant end user into that building that the community feels is their right to have. Um, we also have some funding for estate buildings that's coming in a slightly later phase but our HAS funding does cover uh, the estate buildings as well. Can I just move on to the next slide, please? Um, St Peter's area of Huddersfield, effectively we've packaged up uh, Huddersfield New Market, 
the old post office site and St Peter's Gardens into one. Um, they were all part and parcel of the Blueprint launch. Can you move on to the next slide, please? On Huddersfield New Market, this is the subject of our Future High Street Fund bid to government. We put that in on June the 5th. It was an £11 million pound bid. Uh, we will hear the outcome of that uh, sometime, I suspect, during the back end of this year. Quite a complex business case. The five strands of business case uh, were, were gone through in some, some detail. Uh, we we're quite pleased that we managed to get all the sort of factors into the right. right. The, the BCR was well above the recommended 1.5, which was quite helpful. I think we stand a really good good prospect of accessing that funding. Uh, we're moving now into stage three design. We've had the concept designs done, but we need to put a lot more detail onto that. One of our new programme managers that we've now brought into the council is looking after this particular package of works. So we've got the internal resources as well to see to see that through. And that's moving towards a delivery programme of, of 2023. Have the next slide, please. Queensgate. Obviously, very much the sort of showcase piece of Huddersfield Blueprint captures the sound space projects, Market Hall Car Park, Cultural Hub, which is effectively art, uh, the art gallery, museum elements, library as well, and also the town park concepts. Can you move on, please? So on this one, we've made a lot of use of working with our partners, the consortium Perfect Circle. Uh, we are developing the projects. As you can imagine, there's an awful lot of uh, structural work to understand before we move forward to towards construction. But importantly, we've been developing options for the reuse of Queensgate, what we can fit inside there, the best combination of uses and we are moving forward on a business model for the sound space so that we understand how we need to 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 manage that in the future in particular how we generate revenue to to make that a sustain, sustainable part of our cultural op op offer so we've engaged with a company called ipw they've been involved in a number of uh, major projects across the country the vna in dundee being one of them so we have some quality advice in the background helping us to shape this part of the project. Um, next stage uh, for Market Hall. Sorry, can you just go back up slide? Yeah. Market Hall car park. I think it's probably reasonably well documented that there are some problems at Market Hall. We are moving forward to the next stage, understanding demolition and replacement of that. That does need to be agreed by Cabinet, um, but uh, we are moving forward uh, in the short term on on that, that project. And I suspect that that might be the first, first stage of that particular programme. Town Park, still in the feasibility stage at the moment. Lots of structural work to understand how that is dismantled. Uh, again, the consortium Perfect Circle have been very helpful in uh, providing expertise in that area. So we're able to, to move that project forward. Now we have done some of that technical work. Can you just move to the next slide, please? I just want to touch on a couple of other projects quickly. 103 New Street, developers on site now. You've probably not seen a lot of activity outside, but they just started to move to the external part of the building. Um, and we are still confident there's a delivery there for June 2021. Next slide, please. Cross Church Street. Uh, this is our sort of most advanced bit of public realm. We are looking at funding that is a mixture of council funding and uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority. We've gone through the Combined Authority uh, processes just about. Um, we've definitely got detailed uh, sort of business case agreed now. Um, we are just finalising the detailed design and there will be delivery this year. And I understand that may be as early as, as August. So that is quite a, an advanced project for us. 
Next slide, please. New Street, I just want to touch on that. Cabinet have agreed uh, to use some of the council's identified town centre capital to progress a scheme there between Market Street and Clothall Street. Uh, we are in design and feasibility right now. That project's been led by the highway service uh, and delivery is around mid-2021. Next slide, please. Next slide. So just moving on very quickly to, to Dewsbury, Dewsbury Blueprint, number of strands to that. Um, I just want to pick out some of the key projects that are uh, uppermost in the team's um, current work, work schedule priorities. Can you move on to the next, next slide, please? Dewsbury Market, um, probably uh, moving quite quickly now. Um, we've completed the feasibility on that with a company called Marketplace Europe. They are part of our sort of framework of, uh, of assistance, helping us understand uh, supplies and demand. We have consulted with traders on the sort of initial concepts, uh, and we're just about to go out to do some market re research uh, later th this summer. Uh, and the tenders for the design work are being packaged up together with some of the work on the George Hotel, actually. Uh, so that's they're already out at the moment. So we should be able to sort of uh, put that in place very, very soon. Uh, and we'll consult on a uh, preferred option around the early part of, of next year and then on site at the beginning of 2022. Next slide, please. Dewsbury Arcade. Uh, we did announce at the Dewsbury Lords that we had agreed a sale. That is all completed now. We are now the owners of Dewsbury Arcade. Um, we have the design work out to tender at the moment. The first phase of that is, is remediation and making sure that we get the repairs to the listed structure right. So that's already out. Um, we should be on site very early in 2021. I think it might even be a little bit earlier than that if we can get through the procurement process quickly. Uh, and to complement that, we're very much aware that uh, we need to fill that building with uh, a new new set of businesses. And this last fortnight, we've just appointed a specialist community and business development coordinator uh, to help us with, with that work. So we've got the capacity there to, to build up the relationships with the community and bring this forward as a sort of realistic pros prospect for the town, town centre. Next slide, please. Finally, in Dewsbury, this is uh, the third key project that we're progressing. This links back to my earlier comments about transforming cities, um, which was announced in March. Uh, we have an identified £8 million pocket of investment for the bus station. We're progressing again with the business cases through the Wicker phases. Uh, we submitted this just a bit ahead of the Huddersfield one, actually, on the 1st of June. The next phase will go in on the 20, uh, in January 2021. And again, a similar delivery time frame to fit with the funding is uh, 2023. So they're the three key ones for Dewsbury. Um, I'm just going to end the town centre stuff in terms of key projects there. Uh, and Tim's going to pick up on the latest uh, active travel stuff that, that uh, we've been we've been activating in the in the town centre. So I'm just going to hand over to Tim quickly, and then I suspect at the end we we can collect up the questions. Okay, over to you, Tim. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, slide up. Yeah, if, if you could please. Uh, one more, please, and one more. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon. I'll just turn my camera on. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Cabinet members, Ward members and panel members as well. My name is Tim Lawrence. I'm the Transport Strategy and Policy Manager for Kirklees Council at the moment. Um, I'm here today to talk to you specifically about the Emergency Active Travel Fund that the Department for Transport announced in May of this year. Um, Kirklees Council bid for a share of 2.5 million as part of what's what the Department for Transport referred to as Tranche 1. 
as you have, I hope, gained some insight to throughout this whole scrutiny meeting. The bid was designed uh, to complement the June and the June reopening of Jewsby and Huddersfield, and it focused on immediate and short-term interventions. Um, it does also contain some components for limited school streets and district centre work, but we are at the moment looking to do them as part of the Tranche 2 programme, which I'll explain to in this a second. If I could have the next slide, please. Now, this is the bit which I was just about to mention. Hopefully, throughout this whole meeting, you've, uh, you can... You can make the connection between the placemaking concepts laid out in Huddersfield and Dewsbury blueprints and how we can use some of this active travel money within those two town centres to allow some early delivery of these planned infrastructure changes on a trial basis. So we've linked with existing groups in Huddersfield and Dewsbury and we're trying to add some value to the work they are doing around social distancing. Uh, but also trying to reimagine the spaces both within Huddersfield and Dewsbury um, for active travel, um, but also, you know, in terms of exploring and enjoying that public realm with um, the introduction of public art. And a lot of that has been well publicised through our own media channels, but also in the most recent cabinet report. And what we're trying to do here is um, we're trying to use these temporary interventions, at least in Huddersfield and Dewsbury as part of Tranche 1, to support the future direction and regeneration ambitions of both Dewsbury and Huddersfield. If I could ask for the next slide, please. So we have the confirmation of the Tranche 1 funding. Kirklees has a share of that West Yorkshire amount. What we're interested in doing now is working towards the Tranche 2 funding. And I can pick up on Councillor Bolt's comments earlier on in the um, in, 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 in the meeting, whereby we now need to look at what options district wide there are through this fund to improve uh, active travel, to augment what we already have, and to provide some meaningful links, perhaps between stations um, and settlements. Um, looking at some of the main arterial roads and, and where a reallocation of space might be beneficial and implementable, if I could use that word. Um, so I wanted to work up a programme across the whole district that focuses an ambitious but deliverable programme of active travel measures. And we, and we want to do that as part of the tranche two, which is the, uh, the 10.05 million that's been announced as well. We've not got any indication as to how we're going to get that. But what we do know is that that's an indicative amount that the government has set aside, if you like, for West Yorkshire as a whole. There is a website, a um, little um, snap, sneak screenshot of it on there. It's an interactive tool and it allows interested parties to select an area, drop one of the coloured pins uh, onto that area and provide a brief explanation of what people think might be useful um, in terms of this emergency active travel measure moving forward. Uh, so we're talking about social distancing or perhaps safer cycling opportunities. Um, it's important, I think, you know, we, we deal with this particular um, batch of funding, if you like, under this emergency active travel. Um, you have heard reference made by other um, ward members and by our cabinet member that we are engaging in meetings and discussions moving forward about how we will take a much broader active travel strategy as part of a transport strategy forward. Um, this will be one, one part of that, but it's my intention over the upcoming months to, to work up something more, more wider ranging, uh, ambitious and deliverable. This is just one section of funding that's been put forward by the DFT at this particular moment in time to capitalise on the, the environment for cycling that could be promoted. So I'm going to leave that there um, because Obviously, we had some time for some questions, and I'm, we're happy to take some. Can I just say, uh, Chair, I, I did miss out one of the slides, and that was to do with Pioneer House. Um, just an update on that is uh, the works are ongoing. And ex the, the latest information I have, it will open around October time this year. Obviously, it's been a, bit, a little bit of a delay, but um, it is quite a sort of important project in the Dewsbury blueprint, and it's, it's significant in terms of bringing in that footfall into into the town. So that that'll be quite a sort of uh, big leap forward for us. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, th thank you both for your uh, presentations. And firstly, I just want to say, I know it's been a difficult, challenging time for all our colleagues. So thanks again for everything that you and your teams have, have been doing uh, during this uh, pandemic. So we've had indications uh, to speak. So I'm going to bring in Councillor John Taylor first. Thank you. Um, and again, I'll echo that to Simon and Tim in terms of thanks. I think my, my one observation, to be honest, Simon, was was probably too much information. Um, uh, well, I, I, there was too many projects, but probably not enough information of the individual projects. It would be it would have been better and more easy for us to scrutinise and understand if we'd looked at a number of the projects in a little more detail. Because all we've really done is cantered through at a headline everything that we're planning on doing. And it's really, really difficult for us to get under the skin of that, if I'm honest. Um, so my, my preference for for next time would be um, less but more detail, if that makes sense. I just think it, it's difficult for us to, to really comment on. Um, I just wanted to pick up really um, on a couple Councillor of Councillor Taylor, could you just turn your camera on if that's OK? Thank my you. Camera's on. You're on now. You're back. <laughs> well, I haven't been anywhere. <laughs> um, so um, just on Dewsbury Arcade, um, and I hear what we said about we've, we've appointed a community stroke business coordinator, but Dewsbury has plenty of vacant retail space, and we've now just created more of it. And I just wonder, have we a firm plan on how we're going to, because that arcade, when it's when it's repaired, will look fantastic. And it, it you know, reminds me of, um, I can't think of the name of them, the, the couple that there are in the centre of Leeds. But if we don't have the right retailers in that arcade, it will deteriorate very, very quickly. So I have a, I just have a worry that we've, we've invested in something and we're investing in growing retail space in a town where retail space is shrinking. And it is always going to face the challenge of um, White Rose, what, three, four miles down the road, which has free parking, but we don't have free, well, we do temporarily at the moment, but we don't <laughs> tend to have free parking in Dewsbury. So just a comment on that. And similarly with the market, um, the market used to have a brilliant reputation and was was a go to place and it's kind of lost its way. And again, you know, it's great to see that there are plans for the market, but we could do is sharing a bit more of that vision with us to give us some confidence that we do actually understand how these things together are going to change, change the centre of Dewsbury because I don't feel I've got any sense of that at the moment. I know I know we have high level visions, but have we done the research in the market and does it still stack up post COVID that these are the right things to be doing? Because we haven't really made any comment on that. And then finally, just one for Tim. Um, is it possible to share with us the website for that active travel? Um, you know, the link to that website, if you could, Tim, um, just so we can share that with people locally and get people engaged in it. Um, because I, I do worry on the active travel, and this is me, me being parochial and representing my ward, that my ward's going to be one of the wards that will probably won't, won't get any very active travel because nobody's really going to walk into Huddersfield from out in my patch and buy their shopping and walk back again. Um, or even, to be honest, cycle down the A629. Um, so um, just, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but thank you for that. But maybe next time, less is more, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Cogs, did you want to respond directly or do you want to take another comment first? Simon, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Well, I should get used to it, shouldn't I? Really. So there was quite a lot in that. Just, a, just a few comments. I think. Um, uh, take your point about less might be more. That's a, a fair point. We'll take take that away. Um, on the arcade. Um, well, actually, the arcade is is part of that vacancy problem right now. So we we've got to bring it back into use. We're not creating more vacancy. It's completely empty. Uh, it's probably the highest concentration of vacancies in 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 the in the town centre. Um, what I would say is, um, 
we probably won't be looking at retailing. We won't turn retailing away, but it is it is about finding new uses for those those units there and creating the right size of unit to attract the right businesses in. So it could be sort of startup business space. It could be creative work, workshops. It could be all sorts of sorts of things. That's why we've brought this expertise in so we can di diversify the, the uses there. And I think that links a little bit to your point about, you know, do we understand what's going to happen post COVID? Well, I have to say, who does? Uh, all I know right now is uh, internet shopping has spiked again, which means those people who weren't using it before probably are now and probably won't return to to buying in, in town centres, uh, which is adding, adding to the problems. But that just really reinforces the strategy that we, are, we have. These, both strategies for the towns are not based on bringing in more retail. We will embrace retail. But we know that we have to diversify those those uses. So it might be housing, it might be new business space, it might be something else. So they're all the options that we we really need to uh, explore. Just on on the on the Dewsbury market side of things, we are doing that research, and I, I had that slipped into my many slides. Um, so we we will understand better uh, shortly. Well, we start that program over the summer. What will bring more people back to that market off it? Because one thing we do we do understand from from uh, from being in lockdown is actually people have started to shop a bit more locally, and there's a little bit more um, sort of appreciation for local produce and local go goods. And people are sort of thinking maybe I do want to spend a little bit more on a piece of meat or some de decent quality vegetables. So, so there are those things that are, that are beginning to emerge. Whether that can be sustained is another matter. But I think town centres are, are probably going to suffer more than other sectors post-COVID because A, there won't be the spending power. B, people have moved away from sort of uh, from, from retailing yet again, just at a time when it was difficult enough. So we are keeping a very watchful eye on the landscape. Pretty difficult to predict. I went to a webinar with, with Bill Grimsey again uh, last Friday. Uh, he thinks it's the most difficult time for town centres ever. And that's saying something because he was saying that pre-COVID as well. So we have got a lot of these things in mind. Um, certainly don't want to make the situation worse in any, any, any of the towns. And that's what we're trying to fight against. Yeah, thank you. I think Councillor McBride wants to come in and then I'll bring in the uh, panel members. Councillor McBride. I think it's right, it's right to emphasise the charge because obviously the points made about the arcade, there is a big challenge there. But at the same time, looking at it the other way around, there is a nucleus there of key developments in the centre of this town. There's the market, an £8 million development. There's the arcade, which I'm sure will be successful. Pioneer House opening, bear in mind that was to be the kingpin of the whole lot. And then, of course, the two stations, the railway station, which everyone says is brilliant, the, particularly the facade to the uh, railway station, now linked to the bus station. So you've got a nucleus there around which we can uh, uh, find development. And also there will be the walk link, which will go right through the centre of the town. So a real opportunity for uh, a focus for a, re a redeveloped town. Um, there is no guarantee, but in, in the case of both our towns, we've got to start going for them. And if they don't don't succeed, God help the other towns in the rest of this country. Thank, thank you, Councillor McBride. Um, Tim, I, I presume it's okay to share that the website details. That shouldn't be too much of a problem. Oh, that's not a problem at all. Yeah, I, I just wondered if I could just just a couple of seconds, nothing too of much. Um, I thought got some interesting information there. Um, and I think Councillor Taylor, as you elucidated on the reason for sharing the web link, it, it got me thinking a little bit. Um, once we have this emergency active travel funding issue um, sorted in, in such a way that we have an agreed program and we move forward looking more to the future, I've started to have some conversations with colleagues within the council about the place-based working initiatives that have been going on. Um, I understand 
that what's good for one ward is not necessarily good for another ward. Um, and and it's, it's very much, well, horses for courses if we were doing equestrian-based work. But I think you understand what, what, what I mean. Um, but conversations between ward members are very important. And one of the things about developing a deliverable strategy moving forward is going to be that ward member based con conversation. I have started it with certain ward members who have taken an initiative and got in contact with me and there's been a window of opportunity and I'm happy to continue those conversations throughout this process or we can do it more formally when the active travel element, the emergency active travel element is finished. And that's, that'll be an invite to, to all ward members, not just to yourself. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I've got a couple of members that have indicated if anyone else wants to speak, please put it in the um, in, in the chat so I can make sure your questions are answered. Uh, Councillor Bolt and then Councillor Eastwood. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. I was just trying to help John then because I've contributed to uh, the active travel map. If you just Google active travel Kirklees, it takes you to the West Yorkshire CA active travel map and you can drop pins all over Kirk Burton, John. Um, just picking up on a point that John made uh, about the e economics of Dewsbury. It's not just free parking at White Rose that Kirklees need to be aware of and factor in. I'm sure that uh, members of staff will be aware that Leeds are promoting a new railway station at the White Rose, which makes sustainable travel. You know, it makes it easier for people to get from Kirklees and other places. Yeah, you know, we'll go straight past Dewsbury to be on the train and into White Rose. Yeah, I hope they're factoring in these threats to their retail uh, vision. And a new stay, a new railway station at Ravensthorpe. What the heck's that got to do with uh, shopping in Dewsbury? Can you just leave the bottle of brown sauce to talk, and we'll get on with it? Okay. Can we just stick to stick to our points, please? Yes, I wish we were good. I wish you could chair. Um, in terms of integrated and sustainable transport. I wonder uh, if there was any work done looking at integrating the bus and rail stations like many other areas have done to give a proper interchange. There, there were only maybe 400 yards apart, but if you if you go to Dewsbury, you know, if you're trying to go on holiday to, when you can, to Manchester Airport, get off a bus and you'll lug all your, uh, all your, all your um, cases up the hill if it's raining through Dewsbury. Yeah, we'd have had a better offer if we'd have integrated the, the two uh, things. Uh, in terms of transport, uh, active travel, Tim, there's been some consultation and a promotion of a scheme of a cycle route from the rear of the station. Is it Ashworth Road or something? Uh, which I'm not familiar is a well cycled corridor. Most people coming into Dewsbury would either come from the Calder Valley Greenway, the Spen Valley Greenway from the west, or from uh, the Osset Greenway potentially at the other end. So I wonder if there's any any reasoning behind that, if you can share us with uh, any market research that goes into that. The presentation on active travel talked about links to groups and effective communications, Tim. I'm not aware from my connection with any of the cycling groups in Kirklees, of which there are, there are many, that any of those have been consulted and involved with um, the, these schemes. You know, things like, you know, you have um, Huddersfield Star Wheelers, Home Valley Wheelers, Ravensthorpe Cycling Club, Kirkley Cycling Academy. There's about a thousand members of recognised cycling groups. And I'm not aware that they're formally being uh, consulted and, and asked uh, which routes did they use. Um, it's not just about reallocating highway space. There's um, a scheme that's just come up on social media where, you know, putting the, uh, the bol a few you know, bollards down a, a road using uh, the plastic road spacing, which we already have probably stacked up in Flint Street. You can reallocate highway space without it costing a fortune and educating drivers using material like the DFT Think campaign has been something which I've been asking for for about four or five years uh, on the road into Huddersfield from the home valley where highways created dangerous pins points at Berry Brow. And we still see that now. And I would invite leading members and the officers to come out for a ride um, at peak period. Come and ride these roads with me and you'll, you'll see what the cyclists have to put up with. And sometimes the aggression from drivers who don't understand 
why cyclists now have to move into a more positive position on the road. The situation in Kirklees is one which is recognised nationally. I've just had a, a message from a respected transport um, commentator Christian Walmar uh, about a scheme in Batley because it's 14 years ago since he recommended wooden bollards were taken off greenways and we've got one in Batley where parents have appealed to the leader of the council to say yeah why are we having wooden bollards blocking greenways so that they can't get through when they're taking their children to school without leaving the children on the road it's amazing that it's taking so long to resolve these things the regeneration um, issues when Kirklees are, uh, are looking at asset transfer to community groups and I know from Murfield Town Council, they ask for a business plan. Murfield Town Council were considering an asset transfer of the public toilet building in Murfield and Kirklees asked for a business plan about how you could uh, sustain the economics of running a free public toilet. So I think it's reasonable that the public should ask where is the business plan for these big schemes that we've got in Huddersfield and Dewsbury? You know, where are we going to see, where does the money stack up from the expenditure and the income? Yeah, you know, If you're asking for it for a free public toilet with the multi-million pounds that are, are going on in Huddersfield and Dewsbury, I think it's reasonable that we should see that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bolt. Um... I'll just quickly bring in a, a point. Councillor Murgatroyd, do you want to bring in your point now? Because I know you've got to leave in a minute and we probably do need to start winding up. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, thanks, Simon and um, uh, John. It was, yeah, really, I, I just agreed with John's point, actually, about next time. It, I think it'd be good to focus on particular issues, um, on some specifics. I mean, I'm particularly interested in... Um, uh, issues around Queensgate and the, um, the market. Um, I mean, uh, but it was really useful to get the broad brush picture. So uh, thanks for that. OK, I've got to go because my, my son's just had a job interview and I want to find out how we got on. So sorry, I've got to oh. go now. Well, All good right. luck. Good luck. I know it's a tough time for everybody. So All pass right. yeah, it out. OK, All right. thank See you. you. Bye. Thanks. Simon, I might just bring in Council Eastwood now as well, and then we could um, perhaps bring all the comments together if, if that's OK. Councillor Eastwood. Right, OK. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's good to see that uh, there's some positive uh, action being, in pro being made. Uh, what I would say uh, regarding uh, the cycling lanes, or whatever we do for act making things safer, so what type of cycling lanes are we looking at? Are we looking at just a painted line down the road or are we actually looking at a barriered cycle lane or a totally separate cycling lane? Can't say cycling lane. Uh, personally, the more off-road cycle paths that we have, the better. Uh, I've cycled abroad and it's so much more comforting uh, when there's you know, you're just cycling with no vehicular traffic around. Uh, that's about it, really. Uh, oh, the George Hotel, sorry. Uh, I know things, the schedule is saying completion 2024. What I was asked is, is there anything in place or likely to be in place in time for the Rugby World Cup so that the town can make the most of what there is there? There's going to be a lot of interest in the Rugby World Cup in, I think it's October 2021. So the what we the most of what we can make out of it would be would be great for the town. Uh, so yeah, an update on that if you could, that'd be great. Thank you. I don't know who wants to come in, and the, I think this Simon, did you want to come in initially? Yeah, initially I think I will. Just to just to pick up at the point about business plans. Yeah, I take your point, Councillor Bolt, but I can say that we are working forward. Uh, business plans on all the key key projects that I highlighted in my pres presentation. The, the main one being Queensgate uh, and understanding the sound space business plan, um, which we've got those specialist advisors uh, that we're working with. So uh, I think we've, we're, we're covering those points. Um, just on the George Hotel, um, so I signed off today, sort of all the remedial works that take us up to uh, sort of the middle of next year. 
Um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of stripping out and putting back the basics. But we will work with rugby league cares and rugby league or organisations to make sure that there is something to tie in with the uh, rugby league world cup next year. That's an ambition for rugby league cares. I think it'd be a bit foolish to, to expect that the museum would be uh, open by then. That's only a very short time frame, but it doesn't mean to say that we can't use the George in some other way and the spaces outside on St George's square to, to showcase and highlight the, the connection between the two. I think that's it. I think the others were a bit around attack to, uh, to travel. I think do you want to pick some points up, Tim. Yeah, and I think Naz wants to come in as well. So, um, Chair, do, do you mind if, because mine nicely follows on from Simon's. Of and course. Then, and Tim yeah. can pick up. Is, uh, and just on that point, it's a really good point about using the George now as that kind of iconic profile raising uh, opportunity. And so tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to a meeting with Rugby League Cares to talk about how we wrap the George round into the 125 year celebration on the 29th of August. Uh, and then beyond that, what the campaign trail to Rugby World Cup 21 looks like as well, and the role the George will play in terms of the various milestones we'll reach on, on, on the George and using that as a trail. And of course, there'll be other initiatives, but um, that's not the purpose of today's scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Chair. So, um, Councillor Bolt raised a number of um, issues that, that are currently live around the district. Um, cycle routes from the rear or accessing the rear of um, Dewsbury Station, some dangerous pinch points on A616 as a result of islands. Th these are, I'm summarising his points here, I'm not necessarily quoting them. Uh, the continued use of wooden bollards uh, in Batley. Um, I think what we'll probably have to do, because we're here to talk about the emergency active travel measures, is that I will take them away and provide a response to Councillor Bolt and, and anyone else that wishes to be count, um, copied into those responses. Uh, I'll do some investigation as well in the interim. Um, the, the one thing that relates particularly to the active travel is about the effective communication and links to groups. Um, with this particular, um, with, with tranche two of this funding pot, um, everybody is invited to um, have their say via the online consultation uh, web address that Councillor Bolt has very handily put on the side of the chat for us to have a look at. And um, it is without question, I think, that moving forward as part of an active travel strategy, a bit more time to embrace um, a much more kind of comprehensive consultation that will be in contact with groups. Um, cycle groups that Council Bolt knows, um, active travel groups elsewhere around the district to get a more comprehensive view of the art of the possible, uh, what is wanted um, and what, you know, how we can grow cycling um, in, in, in a way that is advantageous for, for the economy, uh, but also as well um, that deals with the, the climate change emergency that, that Gurkley's Council has recently announced. So we will be in contact with groups um, that may be through uh, Councillor Bolt, that, 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 you know, that may be through a, a list and there'll be consultation. But for this active travel tranche, then those groups are more than welcome to provide their response through the website that uh, is on the site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. So, uh, th thank you for coming uh, along today, all of you. You've uh, given a, a really good presentation. Um, just just to round this up, um, I mean, on the on the George Hotel, uh, you know, personally, I think this is very exciting. I'm a rugby league fan myself, so you know, my sister works in rugby league, so I know how how vital and how important that building is um, to our heritage, really. So. Uh, for me, that's that, that's excellent, and uh, I think as Council Eastwood has has, has said, um, um, the opportunities there with with the World Cup are, are really good. Um, just on the point about how we might look at this differently, how we might look at our plans differently with with what's happened with COVID. Um, I'm sure you're doing doing some of that work, but it'd it just be useful to sort of emphasise that because I think this crisis has shown that we. Can look at things differently, particularly around active travel. 
um, you know, it has shown what an impact we can have on air quality, on, on climate change, the way we travel. It has taken a massive crisis, <laughs> you know, to, to do that. We haven't just changed our behaviour ourselves, but I think there are things we could look at differently and the same with our town centre centre plan. So I hope we would be, you know, we would be having a little bit of a think about that and, and, how, and how we're investing as well. Um, and yes, I think those were the were the main points I wanted to to, to make there. So thank you so much uh, for your presentation um, and for coming along today. Sorry, Chair, um, could it? Yes. Uh, I, asked, um, I did ask if there'd been any consideration of integrating the bus and rail stations in Dewsbury. Uh, okay. Yeah, if we yeah. could have an answer on that. Is, is is there anyone here who can answer that right now? Or, or, or you know, perhaps you want to think about it and come back to us. That would be, that's a good suggestion, yeah. Chair. We'd, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll take yeah. that away. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. That, that'd be really helpful. Thanks a lot. Um, so panel members, the last thing is I just wanted to go through the work programme. It's in your papers. Is there any comments that you want to make at this stage? Obviously, this is all, all draft. It does need adding to. We might want to have a little bit more of a think about um, what we want to prioritise during, um, given the COVID crisis. I'll give you a minute or so just to have a look and if, if you want to say anything. I realised I was muted there, so it, we, I was just asking members to look through the work programme to, uh, to ask if they wanted to add anything. Um, I think everyone's OK for now, but if you did want to send an email through, please do send it through <laughs> to myself and to Lee. And Councillor Bolt thinks I've done a fair job, which is nice cross party <laughs> support there. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, Councillor Bolt. Um, thank you, members, for taking part today. I want to thank um, our governance officer, Lee Webb, who's um, helped put the meeting together. And also a big thanks to the digital team that have been working in, in the back, background today as well and, and made sure everything goes off without a technical hitch. So thank you so much. And um, so that's it. I'll, I'll call the, the meeting to an end. Thank you very much, members, and see you next time.